Okay, hi there, my name is Daniel and I am a tech designer in our design team. Today I'll be talking not about my job, but about my hobby, photo hunting, wildlife photography. They often ask me, how did you get into that? When did you get interested in wildlife? And I always want to ask back, when did you stop being interested in wildlife? So today I'll be talking thinking that all of you are somewhat interested in wildlife or just going to take a camera and go for a stroll in the park. So here's my plan for today. I will be talking about the selection of photo gear, what you need to photograph wildlife. Briefly, I will talk about where you can find the fauna <laughs> and also give you a few practical examples in the end. So first thing you have to think about is, of course, your gear. Since today I am the advocate of wildlife photography, I will debunk the myth about the expensiveness of this hobby. So here's my list. You can see here a camera and a lens. And of course, some easy to care, not very colorful clothing, binoculars is very useful. I had a couple of failures when I've been crawling on my stomach, on my belly, down the swamp to something that turned out to be a piece of canvas in the end. You need something to sit down or lie down on the ground, and a snack is always welcome when you're in the wild. I believe on this list there might be questions about the lens and the camera, so let me talk about that. Since we're talking about the beginning of your career as a future National Geographic photographer, I do not recommend you to invest $20,000 uh, into the most advanced, newest gear. There are two approaches here, pretty much, buying new gear from amateur segment or some older gear from pro segment. You can argue for hours about the best option here, but the key point of the slide is that for a start you can easily do with a budget of $500. And after getting some experience and practice you can actually adjust your set. For example, getting some super popular Zoom 100 for 100 or 150 600. I can give you a few recommendations in addition to that. First, the first thing to invest into is a good lens. And second, be not afraid of used gear. And third point, don't listen to this disputes Canon versus Nikon versus whatever. It only matters what's convenient to you. Technically, it's pretty much all on the same level. I personally prefer prime lenses, meaning lenses with uh, fixed focal length without the ring to zoom in or zoom out. On this slide you can see my set and it's based on my current approach and photo preferences. I really love macro and I shoot birds from the height. The disadvantage of my set is that I really cannot carry it too far. An image that I found online, this is the extreme set of another animal photographer, Morton Halmer. And it's not all of the set, these are just the screenshots from the video, this is just his set for one particular trip. Okay, we've been talking about what you can shoot with, let us talk about where you can shoot. I will try my best to highlight four major types of locations, and I will be talking about advantages and disadvantages of every one of those based on my photo examples. So first option, for the laziest ones or for those of you who are busy, just look into the window and see what's outside. Although, you can also be smart about this sort of approach. First of all, just set a decent bird feeder and from time to time add some unroasted seeds or nuts into there. For example, my friend who is a lathe operator at the factory just set a couple of pretty sticks by the bird feeder next to his country house and shoots out of the window. The results are pretty decent, as you might see. Of course, it's not that easy to get amazing shots from the window of your city apartment, but you just have to apply some ingenuity and don't forget about the seeds. Here's a photo of long-tailed tit that I shot from my window. Another part of location in the city requires more time and effort, but it can potentially bring you more pleasure. You should investigate all of the parks around your house. Not necessarily big parks, a bunch of trees and bushes between the houses would be enough. You just need to know what kind of wildlife lives there and how you can lure it. The secret is simple. Every living being needs three major things – eating, drinking and sleeping. If there is one of those things, you will have wildlife to photograph. I'll give you a simple example. Junkyard. An endless source of food for mice, pigeons and seagulls. And of course, those are a perfect lure for hawks and owls. Or a good example for Russia. The never dry puddle in the middle of the courtyard. A perfect place to bathe or drink for sparrows and tidbits. Or just the thickness of pine trees is a very cozy place to hide and sleep. You just need to be attentive and remain patient. You don't need to wear your hacky uniform in a park. You just need to be able to blend with the environment, but I still prefer to wear the clothing of some earthy colors. 
I've made 75% of my photos in the nearby parks. Of course, when you approach as close as the shooting distance, all of the animals are scattering around. Nobody trusts human beings. I just sit down and wait as long as it takes to become the part of the environment. The animals are curious, so they would approach and just investigate me. They're not stupid, that can tell the difference between me and the rest of the environment. They cannot get used to human beings, but they recognize me and memorize me quickly, knowing that I'm not dangerous, especially if I feed them. It's much harder with predators and birds of prey, it's very hard to get their trust, but if you're patient enough, you can find them and approach closely enough. Here's another long-tailed tit. Here's the fledgling of the field fair. Fledgling is the nestling that just escaped from the nest, but it doesn't know yet how to fly properly. And this is another tit. Another type of shooting environment is the borderline of natural habitat. That's closer to professional shooting, and here you'd be able to find more special birds and animals, but of course, you would need to prepare more meticulously. You would need to think through your attire, plan the timing, investigate the place so that you would know whom and where you can find, and of course, read about the behaviors of the species that you found during scouting. Usually, you'd get decent photos at a third or fourth approach. There are many reasons to that. For example, you came in a wrong time, you hid in a wrong place, or hid in a wrong way. The main thing here is to be perseverant and learn to enjoy the process. I once spent a few hours in a pile of garbage for a vague opportunity to see the hunting of Marsh Harrier. I have not seen it, and the smile in this photo is not because I'm happy, but because I'm just being sucked in and trying not to fall. I've collected quite a few devices to put together a mobile hide, and I believe fishermen, hunters, strike ball players, paintball players, the military have these sort of things too. You can often do without special concealment. The objects that stay low and don't move much usually do not bother your potential models. And that's how I captured the rough bird um, just lying by the edge of the water after a storm at Kotlin Island. There were lots of seaweed after the storm on the shore and the seabirds were just feasting without paying any attention to the photographers. And from the same series, the lift up at dawn. Of course, you'd not be able to conceal yourself perfectly, but it's more important here to stay down and not bother. And then you'll be able to see the world as it is, pure, pristine, without human intervention. As for the fourth type of location, I'd put it into two types. First is shooting off the water, from the water. That's the perfect case of deep immersion into the natural habitat. I love this sort of shooting, but I don't do it often because it's quite complex and requires a lot of time. You can see on this slide all of the advantages and disadvantages of this type of shooting that I could think of. The view from the waterfront is pretty amazing, and besides, the birds do not expect a human to be there, so they behave pretty naturally, they're calm, they're relaxed. The main disadvantage of this type of shooting is, of course, that you need gear, and here's a small commercial for the company that makes that sort of gear. So now you understand why I call this approach the frog method. The price of this device is 1000 euros, and of course you can find more affordable solutions in the market, something compact, inflatable, but the price is pretty much in this range, plus or minus 100 euros. And being a classical Russian, I decided to go the other way. I sketched a blueprint, went to the hardware store, 
did some sewing and put together this sort of thing. Of course, it doesn't look as fine as a thousand euros and it has a major disadvantage. It's super heavy, so it's pretty hard to get it from the car to the water. But you can get anywhere on this thing. It's not afraid of floating garbage, reeds. It has great flotation ability. I'm 100 kilos weight and I feel pretty confident on the wave. So here are a few examples of the photos that I made this summer. The birds are sitting, drinking, sleeping, while I'll photograph them from a distance of 4-3 meters. Second type of location with deep immersion to habitat is of course different kinds of national reserves, sanctuaries, national parks, that's the top of the location for wildlife photography. It costs a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort, but you'll get the most bang for your buck. But you would definitely need local guides and experts to find and approach the animals and birds that you're interested in. As a photographer, you cannot learn the behaviors of all the birds and animals. You cannot crawl over all of the swamps and bushes of this planet. You need local guides to help with that. I once went to the swamps near the city of Petrozavodsk. Local animal photographer, here's him waving from the tent, hosted three days of shooting of black grouse courtship. I made a hide from a $20 Chinese stand, made holes in a tent, windows in all of the four directions, sleeves. That was my first and so far only experience of the kind. I didn't get many decent shots, but the experience was very insightful. I mean, I've been observing literally the shots that I've only seen before on Discovery Channel. I wanted to go this year again, but COVID reshuffled my plans. Earlier I went to Lassi, to his wildlife photography base in Finland. Lassi is known as one of the pioneers of these field photo business for wildlife photographers. In the odds he had a base in the north of Finland, close to the borderline with Russia. He had their baits for wolves, bears and wolverines. Lassi is a decent photographer himself, so he arranged everything in a very thoughtful way starting with scheduling and continuing with individual recommendations to every photographer depending on preferences, intentions, abilities and gear. I didn't have much money, so I went there for about a couple of days and made a dozen of not very great shots of bears. I think you need seven or ten days there to have a better chance for good lighting. My third attempt to go to this sort of place was for the New Year's, when I went to see my mother-in-law in a small town of Veliki Luki on the border with Belarus. And they have this place called the Lodge of a Wood Spirit. There was one stationary hide organized not by photographer like in Finland, but by zoologist, who was mostly interested in watching. 40 meters away from the hide they were dropping the bodies of the animals hit by the car on the road. That is a perfect lure for wolves, foxes, golden eagles, sea eagles. Also, the zoologist took me around the vicinity, so I had a chance to see larger animals, not so much to photograph them. So, summing up our review of the places to do wildlife photography, I'd like to say this. City dwellers believe that there is no wildlife around. And the only way to get a good shot is to go somewhere to Finland. But here are figures for St. Petersburg, a large megapolis. Over 500 species of birds, and that's only birds. So you see, they've not been driven out by transports and factories and millions of people. Those millions of people are actually eyes which can help you track those animals and birds. The news that somebody saw an owl can quickly spread around and you can quickly go to the place and see it. Although photographers prefer to hide their places of shooting, maybe they're selfish, maybe they're noble, there is even a hashtag for that. But you can always open maps and take a look at uh, the map of the area where you're going to take a stroll and it's pretty straightforward. Grey, bad, green, good. Grey with the blue is really good. I told you about the gear, I told you where to shoot. Let me share with you my modest experience on how to shoot. Let me give you a few fundamental rules. Of course, you should know the light. You must understand the light. Photography is literally translated as writing with light, drawing with light. That is a beautiful metaphor. 
Let's give an example of a studio photographer. You have all kinds of lighting in the studio. You can easily control the lighting and the model. Studio photographers have tons of devices to express volume and color of the subject. I do not implore you to go and learn studio photography. I'm just showing this slide to show you different types of lighting that you could use as a wildlife photographer as well. By the way, I heard that every presentation should have a joke, so here's a joke. The therapist and the veterinarian are arguing whose job is harder. And the vet is asking the therapist, what do you begin the examination with? Well, he says, I ask what hurts. Yeah, says the vet. Everybody can do that. What I mean to say that in a wild life, you cannot regulate the intensity, the hardness or the direction of lighting. You need to take into account the time of day, the season. You should be able to use the natural reflectors and diffusers. You always need to track the weather forecast. A few examples of my shots made during a different time of day. Early in the morning, midday and at sunset. Or, for example, how I've been using natural diffusers and reflectors. Both shots made at bright, direct sunlight, but they don't seem too contrasty. On the left, you see the finch on the plum tree. The foliage works as a reflector and as a diffuser for backlight. The rough bird on the right is evenly lit up by water reflections from the bottom. So you see the lighting more resembles the lighting during cloudy day, moderately cloudy day. But in addition to hardness and intensity of sunlight, we should always bear in mind the color temperature. Of course, this parameter could be easily fixed in post, but you should always remember that there are limits to what software can do and what our eye can see. Here's the example of three photos. First of all, the side light draws out the volume very, very well. And take a look at the color. Sunrise and sunset, when the clouds are low, creates lots of extra reflections. And we get the shades of color that are inexistent during a daytime. Color is essential in any photography. And we cannot control much of it in wildlife photography, but you should always take it into account and plan your shooting sessions, not only taking into account the behavior of animals and birds, but also weather and time of day. And of course, following the best practices and traditions, I need to give you 10 tips that you didn't ask for, I guess. As ridiculous as it sounds, you should always plan in advance. Seriously, many times I came to the swamp without rubber boots. I forgot the anti-mosquito spray. I drove for 100 kilometers, then I forgot that I didn't take the battery that was charging. You are like a SWAT team member. They have different types of uniform for different tasks, different missions. They have a list of things that they always must take with them. The rule is universal. Take more. Take more instead of suffering later. Without going into too much detail, next tip. Take my word for it. If you're not going for cheap Instagram photos, but potentially you would ever want to print photo or send it to a competition, if you can't spend 10 to 15 minutes at your computer to perfect the image in editing software, shoot raw and use the broader scalar gamut. Normally it's Adobe RGB. Never delete the photos in the field. The image that at first glance might seem completely useful will in the end be a winner if you dedicate a little bit time and take a second look. Shooting in RAW is always better, of course, if you have time to edit and space to store the files. Tip number three. Whichever gear you prefer, you always need to learn how to use it. Even read the manual like two or three times. A good example is a piano player. He's not looking at his fingers and keys. He's looking at the score. So you should be looking into the viewfinder instead of looking at your camera. Tip number four. If you want a good shot, don't shoot from bottom or from above. This is a handy advice for other circumstances. Try to test it on your pets or your children. Always shoot from the eye level of the subject that you're shooting. That changes the perception of the object and it stands out against background. Tip number five. A good wildlife photographer is also the zoologist, the naturalist. You should know the animal that you're photographing. I don't mean that you should be publishing white papers, but you should have the understanding of their behavior, and that will make miracles. You'll be able to anticipate the movement and know what to expect. For example, you photograph an animal with some very complicated courtship, knowing that in advance you have a chance to actually photograph that moment. Or like on this photo, I noticed the bird rocking before taking a flight and I caught the moment of the takeoff. Number six. 
Even if you're not a Boy Scout, be prepared. Always be prepared. Your camera must be ready, your, your finger must be on a shutter button. And your camera settings should be appropriate for the condition, of course. Tip number seven. I have not learned this one yet myself, but I realize that it's important, because it's not the easiest thing to do this. My more experienced friends are saying that this is pretty possible. If you look into the viewfinder and close the second eye to concentrate on your shot, you might miss and not see something that surrounds you. So you'll probably miss a very important and interesting thing happening just near you. Or might notice something that will ruin your shot or improve your shot. Tip number seven. Modern cameras can shoot much faster than 20 frames per second. But even if your camera can shoot six or seven frames per second, that's not bad. Shoot burst when the scene is dynamic. I mean, you can always delete the shots that you don't need, but you cannot add that special moment in Photoshop. And a millisecond can make a difference between a brilliant shot and a missed shot. Tip number nine. To illustrate this slide, I wanted to show you this image. It's my personal shame. I was not experienced and didn't know much about this bird, and I was nervous in the moment. I made the shot in 2016. That was my first personal encounter with pygmy owl. It was hunting. Just think about how much better this shot could be if I just moved a step to the right or ducked 30 centimeters down. That would completely remove all the branches behind the owl. Now we have lots of visual garbage, too many branches, and the artistic value of the image is lost. And the last tip. Use panoramic movement in these dynamic scenes. When panning, you can freeze the object in time and blur the foreground and the background in the meantime. It's hard to do. This type of shooting comes from car racing, actually, but the cars are moving at a very pred predictable trajectory and usually with a constant speed. Unlike animals who can accelerate, slow down, jump, duck when they run or, or fly. So it might seem that any good photography with this approach is more a matter of luck than skill. But when you learn the behavior of animals, that helps a lot. So not only blurring, but also freezing the movement you can get some very dramatic shots. The bird mid-flight is a special kind of genre with rules and traditions, and the main thing here is short shutter speed and high ISO. Another thing that I've recently discovered, here's an idea that I wanted to share. I think this is very expressive as well. And the final piece of advice. Don't listen to other people's advices, but do listen to them. I mean, you should experiment, you should break the stereotypes. Look for your own way and see what the others do. Good luck and enjoy. Thank you.